hopefully is going to be a conversation space. So I'm going to introduce myself and Catherine, Catherine really quickly. And then it actually would be really nice, uh, given that we've got you know, a relatively small group, uh, if we can go around and people can introduce themselves really briefly as well, um, that would be great. Uh, so feel free to turn your videos and, and mics on as you like. Um, yeah, is really hoping that this will be a, a good conversational space. Uh, so after we do the introductions, my plan is uh, to pose three questions uh, that Catherine and I will both respond to uh, first, but we'll pause at, at the end of each question uh, so that we can all contribute to that space as well. Because there's some excellent people in the room that I'm recognizing some names already who I know have a wealth of experience in this space, far more than me. Uh, so it'd be really great to have their, their voices and everyone's voices in this, in this conversation. All right, so yes, my name is Ben Lohmeyer. I am an adjunct researcher at Flinders University. I'm also head of youth work at Tabor. Uh, Tabor, we offer a Bachelor of Applied Social Science uh, in youth work. Uh, so I'm essentially training youth workers and that's where a lot of my reflections from today is going to be from. Uh, my background is as a practitioner for about 10 years in the non-government sector uh, with young people who are in, uh, disengaged from, from education or in and around the juvenile justice and child protection systems. I'm also postgrad portfolio leader, which is why I'm posting today, uh, and chair of an organisation called Youth Work SA, and they're a professional association for youth workers. That's where a lot of my connections and thoughts around the sociological knowledge uh, and practice exist in around youth work practice. Uh, but we've also got Dr. Catherine Robinson. Uh, she's a social researcher uh, from the Social, social Action and Research Centre uh, at Anglicare Tasmania and an adjunct associate professor. School of Social Sciences, uh, University of Tasmania. And uh, maybe Catherine, you can tell us just a snippet about your background as well. That would be really helpful. Hi, everyone. Um, lovely to be joining you from Tasmania and my kitchen this morning. Um, I spent, have uh, been based in Sydney at UTS as an academic for most of my career uh, and relocated back to my home uh, in 2015 uh, where I joined the community sector uh, at Anglicare Tasmania uh, working now as a social researcher. Um, so it's been a, a kind of really interesting journey for me from uh, basically growing up inside the institution uh, and staying there uh, and then only recently uh, moving over to be based in the community sector. My work has always been uh, very connected with the community sector though. Uh, so when I came back home to Tasmania, uh, a, a lot of people said, well, you're coming home to Tassie, but you're also coming home to the community sector where we think you really belong. So I sort of have two homes, one foot in the academic world and one foot in the community sector. Uh, but my work's been very focused around uh, homelessness, uh, survival of violence and complex trauma, uh, with a particular focus on child and youth homelessness, uh, particularly in my current work since joining the Social Action and Research Centre uh, in, uh, Ang at Anglicare. It's great to be here. Great, thanks for that introduction, Catherine. So I think maybe the easiest way to do this uh, is just for me to go down the list of participants on my screen and ask people to introduce themselves very briefly as we go down there as well. Uh, otherwise, I would try and go around the circle, but I know everyone's arrangement on Zoom is always different. So uh, maybe I'm just going down the list and I'm going to ask, I think, Dan to really briefly introduce himself. Dan, if you want to want to do that. Uh, thank you, Ben. Uh, I'm a sociologist from the University of Melbourne. Uh, also, for a few more months, the president of TASA. Uh, and uh, also, I'm, I'm part of the, the organising committee for Social Sciences Week. So it's a big week for me and thank you everyone for being part of it. That's enough for me then. Thank you, that's perfect. So if everyone can stick to that sort of length, we'll get through everyone reasonably really quickly, which is great. Uh, next on my list is Anne Lawless. Hi everyone, it's and hi to Bill, who I'm meeting for the first time online. Um, Bill and I are working on a project together for TASA, which we're delivering in October. Um, I'm Anne and I have a noisy bird with me and I'm from Fremantle on the west coast of Australia. Great, thank you. And next on my list is Rick Spencer. Hi everyone, my name is Rick. I'm a teacher, Peter 12, uh, identify as trans and my research, which I'm doing through Mel at Melbourne University, is exploring transgender and gender non-conforming students and how they navigate their spaces in school settings which I'm very passionate about, as well as being the convener for media. 
So happy to be here. Thanks, Rick. Welcome. And next on my list is William Calcutt. It's uh, William Calcutt from Sydney. Um, recently completed a major thesis on uh, emergency service volunteering. Great. Thanks for joining us. Uh, next, I have Annette Pyatt. Hi, I'm Annette Pyatt. Um, I'm an undergraduate at La Trobe University. I'm a sociology major. I'm in my final semester. I've only got five more weeks. Yay! And then I go into post-grad studies. Okay, that's me. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, next, I have Ash Watson. Hi everyone, I'm Ash Watson. I am Tarzan's secretary and also a postdoctoral research fellow at the University of New South Wales. Brilliant, thanks Ash. Uh, Catherine Hastings. Hello, um, talking to you from Sydney. I describe myself as being a social research and evaluation consultant primarily, but at the moment I'm waiting for my PhD, PhD on homelessness to family homelessness in Australia to be examined and working as a research assistant on a couple of ARCs to do with housing primarily. Great. Thanks, Catherine. As, as I'm going down, the list is growing slightly. I'm wondering if we're going to like kind of keep growing the whole time, but we'll see if we can get through. <laughs> uh, Emma, Emma Butter, you're up next. Hi, I'm Emma. I'm uh, with Ben on the postgrad uh, subcommittee, the TASA postgrad subcommittee. I'm uh, um, on staff at the Melbourne School of Population and Global Health at the University of Melbourne and also a PhD candidate. Great, thanks, Emma. Uh, Janice Ollerton. Hi there. I uh, teach sociology at CSU Uni up in. Um, Port Macquarie in the mid north coast of New South Wales. My field is critical disability studies. Looking forward to hearing the presentations. Great, thank you. Uh, I have Laura uh, Rodriguez Castro next, I think. Hi, everyone. Um, I am at Ugambe Kombomari country on the Gold Coast. I am an early career researcher that works within um, decolonial studies from Latin America. Excellent, thanks for coming. Uh, Peter Cook, you're next. Hello everyone. Um, so Peter Cook, um, I'm in, at uh, Nipaluna Lutuwita, Hobart, Tasmania. I work for uh, University of Tasmania. I'm a sociologist in the Wicking Dementia Research and Education Centre on secondment from the School of Social Sciences. I'm also currently the TASA Treasurer and the incoming Vice President. So. Thank you, everyone. Looking forward to hearing the discussions. Thanks, Peter. Uh, next on the list is Septrin Kalamba. Uh, right? Hello. Hi. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, I'm Septrin. I'm a sociologist from the Philippines, and um, I'm working on youth and conflict, and I'll be commencing my PhD next year at Deakin University. So, thank you. Great. Welcome. Uh, we also have Sophie Hickey. Hi, um, I'm calling in from Yagra Tribal Country, so Brisbane. Uh, I'm an applied sociologist. I'm the convener for the Applied Sociology Group. I work in uh, improving health services for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. And we just had a session this morning for Social Science Week, which some of you came to. So I hope you enjoyed it. I did very much did. So excited to meet you all. Thanks, Sophie. Uh, next I have is Tanya Smith. Hi folks, I'm a professor from Griffith University, actually trained as a biological anthropologist, but uh, doing work on how women are experiencing and influencing academic culture. Great, thank you. And last I have William Calcutt. Oh no, we're gonna to talk to you, William. Oh, that's great. All right, I think we got it through everyone. Did I miss anybody? Monica, you didn't do Monica? Oh yeah. Monica, are you with us? snuck in the previous zoom meeting went over time um i'm very very slowly working on my phd on the sociology of fatigue and chronic illness which draws on critical disability studies gender studies and uh, health sociology great thank you all right so thank you for doing that i really appreciate it uh it's great to hear the, mm. so much experience mm. and knowledge in the room i'm feeling a little bit intimidated but that's okay uh so <laughs> Let's jump into the conversation. I think it really sets the tone for a conversation as well. 
So the three questions that we want to discuss and have some conversation around are, uh, where do you see sociological knowledge in sort of the social services policy practice space? Um, the second question is what works, what doesn't in communicating sociological knowledge policymakers and practitioners? And the last one is, um, we didn't actually come up with like a really well-formed question around here, but it's something, something around impact and engagement and other buzzwords. And what does that actually mean in terms of policy and practice and how do we encourage and, and celebrate people who are doing work in that space? So I'm going to start with the first question. And as I said before, what we'll do is uh, Catherine will answer the question first. I'll contribute something as well, and then we'll throw it open to some more general discussion before moving on to the next question. So that first question, Catherine, where do you see or use uh, sociological knowledge in social and community services policy and or practice? Um, <coughs> well, firstly, thanks everyone for your introductions. It's really nice to be part of this group. Um, and look, in answer to that first question, I think uh, I really go back to basics and probably kind of second year sociology, second year undergraduate sociology, my own experience, um, being taught by Roberta Julian here at Utah, and a wonderful subject that she uh, taught called Individual and Society. Um, and really, I think, uh, as one of the core uh, contributions of sociological knowledge, uh, the wrestle around thinking about what is the relationship between individuals and the social world. For me, that is my foundation in the kind of uh, socially, social justice oriented research that I now uh, am engaged in. So in particular, I think Bourdieu's work uh, has been profoundly influential in the way that my career's kind of unfolded. Um, but absolutely thinking about issues of uh, inequality, and injustice, uh, um, again, are at the basis of uh, the kinds of topics that I now choose as a researcher. And I think um, when you look through the kind of prism of sociological knowledge, in particular around those core topics of social structure, social reproduction, inequality, they're the basics of what I consider to be kind of sociology's con knowledge contribution. When you approach the world with that lens in front of you, it colours the kinds of work that you do, the ways in which you work, and where you look for solutions to the key social problems that you're confronted with. So um, just to give you a quick example, um, as I mentioned, I've done uh, quite a bit of research around key, key issues of uh, complex trauma, uh, and in particular, uh, unaccompanied child homelessness at the moment. So uh, in thinking about what a sociological uh, uh, response to those issues um, could look like. Um, you know, I, I often contrast that with uh, what a psychological response to those issues often looks like. So say taking the issue of uh, complex trauma, uh, how does one from a psychological point of view uh, provide a response to complex trauma? Uh, you may, uh, you know, do all kinds of particular therapeutic work with the individual. And that may have a great uh, impact on that individual. But why, where sociologists, I think, are different and where sociological knowledge takes us, I think, uh, is backwards. Um, if we want to stop trauma or homelessness happening in the first place, where do you need to go? And, and what kind of discipline gives you uh, the knowledge and ideas and direction as to where to focus your attention? And so for me, that's where sociology directs me to issues around social structure, inequality, and how inequality gets reproduced. Um, what produces trauma? Yes, a psychologist can respond to trauma as a presenting symptom of distress. But how would we stop trauma from ever happening? To me, this is where sociological approaches create new interventions uh, and prompt uh, preventative ways of working. So in particular, uh, where I'm focused at the moment is really around thinking on how changes to uh, housing uh, unaffordability, uh, lack of housing supply and poverty uh, interventions in those spaces uh, will actually have the outcome uh, of preventing trauma because what we know is where families are more stressed, um, trauma and early childhood uh, adversity is more likely to occur, for example. 
so sociology in a sociological way of seeing in the work that I do brings me much more uh, focus on how does one actually prevent social problems from ever occurring, uh, making structural change and inserting questions of justice uh, into the structural space rather than responding uh, to the kind of uniquely presenting distress of individuals. I would say though, and particularly through Bourdieu's work, I have been particularly interested in the relationship between uh, individual distress and structural injustice and how that's manifested and reproduced through the individual body. So I'm very interested in emotion, I'm very interested in lived experience, um, but through my sociological lens, I'm always looking to connect both what's happening uh, at a structural level right through to then the physiology of the individual. I hope that's enough. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's great, thank I'm you. I'm not even sure if that answered the question, but that's how I do sociology. <laughs> I think it absolutely answered the question. I think that's one of the beauties of this kind of question and conversation is it will be diverse uh, in the ways that we, we take that and apply it. Um, so what I'll do in response is just uh, bounce off a couple of those ideas and give some, some practical examples of where it works in terms of practice in, in my experience. I mean, I really actually like the idea you talked about Catherine is that sociology takes us backwards, which kind of is, is funny in some ways. It sounds kind of regressive, but it, but it's not. Uh, and it, it connects for me with a subject that I'm teaching this semester. So as I mentioned before, uh, I train youth workers. And so the subject that we have this semester uh, is social policy and social change. So we're kind of examining it. And in some ways, it's a, it's a um, kind of an applied uh, post-structural social theory course in a way, because what we're doing is we're using uh, if you're familiar with Carol Backey's What's the Problem Represented to Be uh, Post-Structural Analysis Framework, to really do that work of going backwards and saying, well, here's the policy, um, but what is the problem? You know, what is this, what's being represented here? What are the discourses uh, that are at play? And uh, a, lot of, a lot of my youth work students kind of go, why are we doing this subject? You know, from very practical people often, you know, policy, oh, that sounds super boring. Um, but... Uh, we, we get into it and I try and reinforce this, this point to them uh, that their job is literally made or broken by social policy. So youth workers will be employed often uh, in sort of non-government non contexts or other contexts that are funded by government uh, and a change in policy and a change in some of the dominant discourses that are informing policy can literally mean they have a job or not. Uh, their program can exist or not the next year. Uh, then, then similarly, they're their practice can be the making and breaking of policy. So they, uh, the way that they work, the way that they implement their theory, the, the gaps that exist within programs around what you're funded to do versus what you actually do, uh, kind of can be the difference between implementing a policy as it is imagined and the problem as it is imagined versus implementing something that fits but perhaps resists and perhaps uh, offers a different way of of being with young people. So understanding and having the tools of sociological critique, and in this instance, uh, sort of post-structural critique, allows the students to look and understand the context that they're working in, uh, and what are they actually asked to do uh, versus what they want to do with, with young people. And in many ways, I kind of have this conversation that says, look, you might go out and work in the sector and be employed to do a certain thing and find it really frustrating that you it somehow experiencing this dissonance between what you're being employed to do versus what your practice wants to do. Uh, and so you if you have the, the systems and the knowledge of particularly sociological knowledge to critique that, you can, you can understand the system better rather than just feeling frustrated with it. You might still be frustrated, but perhaps there's a, a better sense of purpose within that, uh, within that system. So that, those kind of subjects, those sort of conversations, in many ways, lots of what I do in my teaching is teaching the students to be reflexive and draw on some of that sociological knowledge to inform their reflexive practice. So one example, uh, the next example I kind of want to speak to really quickly is like when I was working in, uh, in NGOs, uh, part of my role was used often as like a policy writer writing for the organisation, so organisational policy at that level, uh, or sort of grant, uh, grant application and program writing. So when we're doing this kind of thing, often we would look for, and this is pre my PhD study, we would look for relevant information and 
and, um, and sources for, to inform our policy creation or inform our um, program creation and grant writing. But we would run up to into this barrier often of the, the classic sort of um, uh, paywalls to accessing uh, the, the really great journal articles and knowledge that is created uh, by academics because of course when you're working in NGO there's no money to spend on um, getting access to these uh, documents and there's very little there's no institutional affiliation or anything like that so in this space it became really important for people who were able to communicate and show the relevance of their sociological knowledge outside of those those um, traditional academic outputs that was a kind of another space where I see it happening and the last one example I'll give is just recently I went out to talk with a group of youth workers who are practicing in our local area. Um, and the, there's a lot of very kind of well-intended uh, and great work that goes on in that space. Um, but uh, often the, the work is, is as a result of um, more sort of ongoing pressures and practice that exist there rather than well-informed again by, by social, social knowledge. But given the opportunity to sit with a, the group of people and ask some critical questions and again draw on, on the, the sociological knowledge that we have, uh, these practitioners usually found it quite refreshing and reviving to go, oh, okay, so the young people that I work with, um, despite some of the, the dominant say, psychological knowledge like you were talking about, Catherine, or uh, the popular sort of public discourse, perhaps these young people aren't to blame for their circumstances. Perhaps there is a structural critique here that's really useful and hopeful and positive. So there's a couple of examples um, from my practice and my experience of where sociological knowledge is useful. So I want to throw it open to the group. Uh, do you have an example for us of where sociological knowledge is put into practice, is useful, or do you have a question for myself or Catherine about some of the stuff that we just shared? I'd like to share something quickly, just as a as a trans teacher, uh, I struggle, and I feel like I'm like the only trans male teacher sometimes because no one, and this is why I entered the field of research, and I'm passionate because I studied sociology back in. 1990 how's that for my age at deacon before deacon became deacon and victoria college and it was wonderful this was the era where you could do 15 units in sociology so i was able to unpack a lot of things as a young at that stage gay person because i felt during a period of aids and hiv stigmatization all around me and it gave me a sense of a voice of you know what this is the structures that are being imposed upon me and I really took a lot of um, liking to Foucault very early on through his uh, power knowledge and how the capillaries of power kind of overlap and shape us. And there are you know, other, other forces into play. And I worked as a social worker for 20 years and I saw a lot of, this has really shaped me on how I used to get always pissed off because I used to think, why is funding always so like this and why are policy makers detached from workers on the field and then later on when I became I decided to retrain as a teacher because I really wanted to make a difference for GLBTIQ uh, students I found that I was not welcomed in a classroom space and it and it just showed me that when I discovered more about what heteronormative lenses were and the work of Nancy Fraser it gave me a thing, I have to do social justice. I have to reduce suicide rates. So sociology to me is a life. It gives me the strength and it gives my students who I've, when I've taught in year 12 sociology, it gives you a way to change the world that, you know, it, it, it's done in such a way that it, you don't just go out there and fight but you go there with the rationale to do the, the social, you know, to, to make everyone have a space and place. But that was my thing that, you know, I wish to God there'd be more people like me that were allowed to teach in high schools because to show our authentic selves to young people will reduce a lot of the stigmatization people face. So sorry for taking up your time, but I just wanted to promote that, that we need more teachers in the high school setting who are authentic and let's promote sociology. Let's why, why can't we make it be everywhere for sociology to be taught? It's the best thing that I love it. Sorry. That's amazing. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks, um, Rick. Like what I, I'm just like my heart is just booming away um, because I, I think 
what you're talking about is the language that sociology offers to both analyse and articulate the social conditions of personal or individual suffering. And what a hugely powerful lever in individual lives, uh, but also, you know, in the greater longer term project of um, significant policy change. So, yeah, thanks. That's excellent. Thanks, Rick. Um, yeah, I love that idea that it is personally sustainable for you as well as it gives you something to do. That's, that's so nice. Has anybody else got a question? Catherine, you've got your hand up. <laughs> thanks. Um, connected to that, and thanks, Rick, because I, I absolutely get what you're saying. And also Catherine's comments about um, broadly structure versus the individual, or for me, um, the power of structures versus the agency of the individual is something I think sociology has helped me to think about. But the other side of it for me is about the role of theory and the fact that it's very easy to get stuck in description. And description is not a bad thing, but there's something about the way that not just sociological theory, but for me, sociological theory works to, gener to abstract, to generalise what we see in the day-to-day -day world and understand it in a, a powerful way that enables us then to come back to the concrete and say something real about the concrete. But that's how it works for me, at least. Yeah, awesome. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's, that's incredible. There's a way to step back from the immediacy and uh, think critically with something that's facilitated by theory. Thank you. Any other thoughts or comments, questions? But it's the redirection. Sorry, my, my, uh, my brain goes slowly, so it just took me a while to think through what you were saying, Catherine. <laughs> it, it's the, it's, it's the, 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 the redirection to practice that the, the, the sociological, theoretical moment can offer that I think is so profound. And I think we can see that happening globally now in the kind of shift towards uh, prevention work. Uh, and the, the big challenges mounting, I mean, just to take another example in the child protection space, uh, you know, the rise of a kind of abolition movement. I know this was touched on in, in uh, another webinar this morning. Um, but again, this is about uh, a kind of uh, multiple disciplines and areas of practice speaking out against uh, just continual risk management uh, of social issues. So uh, the forced separation of children uh, from their family or, uh, you know, the construction of yet more uh, congregate care shelters for those experiencing homelessness. Um, where a sociological view can lead us is to, again, you know, as you were saying, Rick, lead us to reconsider, uh, or perhaps to think about for the first time for some, what are the social conditions uh, which produce these injustices? Um, and, and if we if we if we thought about that, how would that change uh, practice within social services? So within the fields of homelessness and child welfare, for example, rather than child removal uh, or building homeless shelters, um, we would see a shift towards uh, an absolute focus on uh, family supports, uh, keeping families together, ensuring adequate income, uh, ensuring housing supply. Uh, because it's out of that, uh, uh, the breakdown in all of that, uh, that homelessness arises, that child welfare issues arise. Um, so again, what I see is the value in sociology is, is it's shifting uh, our practical and analytical focus. I think it's a really important point. I was, as you were talking, I was reflecting on that's the the promise of it, but it also presents, a, I think, a real significant challenge to uh, people working in the NGO sector, where it's most familiar, because there's such little time in those spaces for that kind of thinking. Uh, and so you, you've got uh, in, in the NGO sector what is essentially a marketized sector of, of services where people... Um, organizations are competing to offer the, you know, the best possible outcomes in the shortest possible time frame and usually translates to practitioners on the ground who, who don't have time or aren't allocated time and for 
a proper supervision with a somebody more experienced or even just a reflective kind of activity. Uh, it's usually very outcomes and efficiency driven. So the questions that you are posing about, well, what are the social causes of this? I never really get raised because it's all about how do I meet immediate need? Uh, how do I address yeah. this issue today or see, achieve a certain outcome that is measurable by a funding, government funding body? So I think there's, there's a huge promise there, but it also is incredibly challenging to find space for that conversation in practice, um, which I think for me means that we, we kind of have to make sure people have these questions before they go out there. You know, they have to have their training that is built uh, around teaching these reflexive skills so that when they get to the practice and they're not given the time, they can at least have that as a critical basis to start from. Um, and then then in addition to all the, the hopefully some people doing some policy work, some advocacy work as well. It's such a great point, Ben, and uh, yes, it has to be inserted much more strongly into um, uh, training, um, but also like the call is there to be taken by those of us who have had privileged space and time to do this thinking. Um, so, you know, I think that's a, a, an endless question for, for anyone who's accepted that privilege. Uh, what are you going to deliver as a result of the time and space you have been given to do that thinking? Um, how can you be part of, uh, I guess, that translation point uh, into practice um, to collaborate with, to lead in some cases, to follow in others? Uh, but how do you contribute what you've taken the time to learn and critique and think about. Um, because while it's held in you or in your institution, it ain't doing nothing. It's the translation and the relationships and the collaboration and the generosity with which that knowledge is transferred uh, and, and with which engagement is undertaken. So important, I think. Yeah, I think that's a really important point and it's a, quite a challenge for us who sit in these privileged places. Um, but I think it also leads us very neatly into our next question. So maybe we'll go into that and people can, can respond to that after. Uh, so what works and what doesn't is the question about communicating some of this sociological knowledge to policymakers, to practitioners. So I'm going to ask you to respond again first, Catherine. Sure. Um, well, you know, while I pan my chest and rave on about translation, um, you know, my, my most recent moment effort at this uh, was met with uh, a two-page letter uh, from uh, the Secretary of uh, Human Services here in Tasmania, um, who uh, was representing the department's uh, displeasure uh, at an interim report I had released on the impacts of COVID-19 on unaccompanied homeless children. So um, I don't think we always get translation right um, and I don't think we can always expect people to listen um, when, and we also have to challenge ourselves uh, as people undertaking some of that translation work uh, to think about in what ways are we going to best be heard uh, when we think we have those important messages um, that governments or uh, other sectors need to hear. Um, and sometimes it's simply that um, uh, often the, the, the kind of sociological view of things is very challenging um, uh, for politics, that's the whole idea. Um, uh, but also I think there's a lot of skill in being a good translator. Um, and so sometimes this is about uh, reading uh, the kind of political appetite to engage with, with certain uh, issues, social issues that you want to bring up. And other times you're just not going to care um, because the issue is such that it needs raising anyway. And, and certainly that's how, uh, that's where Anglicare was positioned with, with recent work. Um, I talked with community service providers around our state about what they saw happening in the lives of unaccompanied homeless children uh, during the lockdown period. Um, and they were quite distressed uh, and, and very much focused on what they saw as a withdrawal of um, essential services to those children uh, during that time. And of course, the, the, the yeah, 
numerous ramifications and negative impacts that it had. Um, but again, yeah, how does one tell that story in a way that's best going to be heard? Um, and thinking through who your audience is. Um, you know, at, at just, I mean, again, just to take that piece of work as an example, there were, there were key messages for the community sector that we felt it was very important to raise, to ask the community sector to challenge itself in thinking through the way it had provided services to highly vulnerable groups during the main lockdown period. Um, and then, of course, to, to challenge government uh, to, to think through, well, what, what does a more appropriate COVID response look like for this group? Oh, Catherine, are you still there? It's frozen at my end. Other people have seen it frozen as well? Yeah, for Catherine, yeah. Oh, okay, no worries. Well, maybe we'll come back to Catherine. When, I was going to ask Catherine Jonas. if that was okay or anyone else or Ben. Um, being in Footscray, um, oh, yeah. seeing, I just wanted to ask you, Catherine, I was yeah. sort of, you know, with the flats, the the, the housing, so housing and the way it was portrayed in the media of the lockdown. And do you think we could have done more as sociologists to kind of be more so on the media because there's a lot of sort of things happening at that point and i was hoping and i'm hoping still that there'll be a change in the way we look at social housing the fact that um a lot of people are isolated you know with the food the inappropriate food having people with police and surveillance and it was like come on it was like the response was so you know, <laughs> like foucault will say this whole this uh, 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 apparatus of power for such a vulnerable, the most vulnerable group in society, and yet they were treated like some sort of, you know, outright cast right. So they'll put out there and on the view and, you know, they were just left. Look, I mean, just to respond really quickly, I think, um, you know, obviously COVID remains and, you know, obviously particular thoughts to those in Victoria, um, you know, a deeply distressing, significant challenge. Um, on the other hand, I think it's had quite a remarkable effect of um, uh, kind of stripping back and exposing inequality and disadvantage in ways which have made it extraordinarily difficult to ignore. And, uh, and by ignore, I don't mean just by government, but, but just the general population. I think the general population has learned more about society in the last six months, uh, you know, than it ever has. Now, whether that's acted on by governments, um, you know, the, the, we'll see at the next election, federal election, um, um, you know, in terms of what's promised. Um, but certainly I think we have a society that's more attuned to disadvantage than it has been. Um, but you're right. Um, I think as sociologists, um, there's a much bigger space than I ever imagined uh, to actually uh, just take a chance and not wait for somebody else to get in the media and say what you think needs to be said. Um, I think we so often assume, particularly if we've come from an academic background where we've kind of understood ourselves as never been good enough, um, we assume that somebody else uh, must be the right person to stand up and say that. Um, well, I think now uh, more than ever is the time to just be that person. And something I'm trying to do in my own work is, is to stop looking uh, for the kinds of things that I want to read uh, and just write them. That's fantastic. Thank you. Uh, Rick, part of your question there I think was about engaging with media. So I thought I'd just quickly throw to Dan Woodman, if, you, if you're happy to, Dan, because I know you do a reasonable amount of media. Is there any commentary or thoughts you can offer us in terms of engaging media around these issues at this time? Um, I, I think that the way I look at it is so sociology does a million different things in the world and 
Sometimes I, I, and it might be the moment I'm in in week, I don't even know what week it is of lockdown in Melbourne. It's lots of weeks where it can, it can just feel too much. And, and the, the way I look at it as a sociologist is there's like things we have to do collectively, but it doesn't mean that every single person has to be doing every part of it all at once. Uh, and and I, I, I think I, I, would, I would go along exactly with, with Catherine. It's like, if you do want to, sociologists should be on the, we've got the expertise that we should be part of every conversation. But, but we also, you know, have a sense as sociologists about the way that conversations, who gets involved and who, who, can, who can have their voice heard and when that voice actually makes a difference in the world depends on all kinds of sociological factors that are, that are, that are not that easy to control. One of the points of Social Sciences Week, I think, is, is for me to, to, to join the dots in people's heads. Catherine was talking about how those fractures in our society have been exposed in a way they haven't been for a long time, possibly, those inequalities. Um, and, and the media is, is full of sociologists who can help people make sense of those fractures in, in a way that sees a bigger picture. Um, but, but it's, you know, it's also something where I worry sometimes that everyone just becomes a talking head and, the, the 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 people who listen and see us in the media don't realise that we're doing something that's more than just being a pundit, you know, or or a, or a scholar. It's I was I was reading the most amazing article or speech that Martin Luther King gave about um, W. E. B. Du Bois. So Martin Luther King, I talked to him about my student to my students. We had open day last last week about someone who who did applied sociology, who studied sociology and then uh, uh, applied it. And he was talking about W.E.B. Du Bois, that he was the exemplar of an engaged scholar, but he also just worked extraordinarily hard to build the real evidence base using a set of tools that sociology gives behind what he did. And he always came back to that foundation, you know, as, as well as being an exemplar of an engaged scholar who, who, Legit, legitimately reshaped the world. W.E.B. Du Bois also was basically an exile from his own country towards the later part of his life. So it kind of, you know, goes back maybe around to that point. It, 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 it's really important and it's something we have to do collectively, but it's tough and not everyone has to do it all the time, that media engagement. Okay, that'll do for me. Sorry, talked for a long time. That's great. Thanks, Dan. I really appreciate that. Um, maybe I'll offer a reflection in a slightly different context for, for communicating sociological knowledge. And then again, we'll open up for a couple more questions and discussion before we get to our third question. So we will quickly run out of time. Um, so I'm just thinking about the experience of communicating sociological knowledge to practitioners again, because that's my area. And for me, as a, a person who was a practitioner first, stepping into the academic uh, conferences, the academic space was kind of, a, in some ways, a bit of a cultural shock because the way of Presenting in those two spheres is, is very different. Um, you know, largely academic spaces, it's about you know, pre your presentation and demonstrating your knowledge and your working and all that sort of stuff. Uh, whereas in the community services sector, that doesn't generally go down super well. Uh, it's definitely more about facilitation than some sort of presentation. I've already spoken briefly about the, the time pressures that often these people are under, but even more so, I think, is this question of so what? Well, what does that actually mean? And here's my context. What does that mean in my context? Uh, so some of the things I've found that are really, really useful is, is to do our best to resist some of those expectations that are usually put on us in academic expect, uh, circles about being the person with the answers or being you know, super uh, well-versed in all the things and being the, the, the expert and do more like, uh, more like talking less more like listening more and being the person who can ask critical questions. I found those critical questions are usually the things that people take away more than that, you know, really well-crafted sentence uh, that we've practiced multiple times before presented. You know, that's uh, the opportunity to ask a question that helps people reflect on the meaning of what you're saying in their context can be the most powerful part of the experience of, of uh, learning about some sociological knowledge. For, for practitioners. So that's really kind of my experience is, is a lot more about facilitation. How do we encourage people to have those conversations rather than being the presenter for practitioners at least. Um, so that's my reflection. Are there any other reflections people would like to bring 
uh, or comments and questions. I'll contribute um, in relating to the pandemic, if I may. Um, one's a positive observation and one's a negative. Um, what the pandemic has done is it's allowed science to reassert its role in informing policy and responses for a very brief time. This is not a natural state. Um, in fact, prior to that, we had science being denied in terms of its causes of catastrophic fires here. So um, for, a, for a, at least a brief period, science has uh, taken a, a very significant role in informing um, how the community should be responding to the existential threat. But what the pandemic has also revealed is just an enormous gulf between the ideal and the theory and the practice in Australia in almost every aspect of Australian society. And um, we have this unusual situation where uh, really over decades we have inquiry after inquiry after inquiry about profound social issues and we get often very good results from that and including research and we do nothing. We do nothing about it. And whether it's aged care or disability or homelessness or youth, uh, I mean, we could go through every single topic that, uh, that you know, is the subject of our inquiry. And uh, we just have an unlimited capacity to assist with uh, nominal and not address the cause. Yeah, that's a really important point. Sorry, Catherine, you look like you're going. Oh, no, I was just about to say that, yeah, I, I really agree. And it's quite a, um, a devastating mirror that I think COVID has held up to Australian society. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, you know, on one hand, it just makes you want to kind of just lie down. <laughs> um, and, and on the other, you know, then there is now an opportunity to push like never before. Um, you know, once you've got your kids back at school and, you know, made sure your employment's all right and, and so on, you know, these are still ongoing issues. But, um, yeah, I think I also have faith in humans and I think people, they can't unsee what's been seen in the last six months. So it's still my hope that um, the future will bring more nuance and compassion and uh, like practical doing uh, in the prevention spaces attached with aged care, homelessness, disability, you know, and, and so on. We have to vote for the people, get the right people to lead that as well, though, in the political space. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Janice, you had a question. You raised your hand at one point. Oh, I was just going... I was just going to make the comment. I'm I'm a practitioner too. I've been 40 years, I think, in human services, disability employment mostly. Uh, and once I became an academic, I was a, I'm a research coordinator in the disability sector, as well as teaching part time at uni. Uh, but the difficulty that I that I face is I'm I'm given the freedom to research. I go to conferences and share it with the industry. But there'll be that lady from Centrelink sitting in the crowd that the CEO is frightened will hear my, my research. So frequently I've done research in the not-for-profit space, but I'm not allowed to publish it because it may put funding at risk. And it's, it's being tied to government funding and government definitions of, of deficit and people with problems rather than let's empower people and give them the opportunities to you know, reach their potential. None of that fits the funding model. So we, in sociology, we are in a really difficult place, but the conflict between our ideology and, and the desire for, for social change and tight-pocketed governments that, well, they've been a bit more generous this year, but have always said, no, we haven't got enough money. Maybe now is the time, William, where they're listening to the academics. We need big projects to you know, change public housing to something more practical, give people jobs building them. Uh, and the sociologists can come out with the data to say, this is what we need. This is what the inquiries have found multiple times. Maybe now's the time to stand up. I do think that they listen to the natural sciences more than social sciences. Uh, 
but maybe now's our time. Who's got the voice? Thank you. Peter, it looked like you wanted to respond. Yeah, can I just say what a really great point you make there because I actually think sociologists are very active in a number of spaces, but funding is always a critical issue and a critical problem. And because we bring up um, wicked issues, I guess, wicked mm. problems, um, and, you know, they're not necessarily cheap or easy to address. And this is where I think there's a couple of things that's really important for us to think about. First of all, it's really important that we don't get caught up in our own world of being sociologists. So by that I mean, and this is mistakes that I made at one stage, is getting too caught up in our theory and concepts because they mean something to us. They don't necessarily mean something out there. So it's about how we communicate, but I'd also say a lot of this is about relationships. So we didn't go in thinking that we have the solutions and we have the answers, rather we've got to kind of work with others and partner with others. And one thing that I learned when I went into a hospital environment for one research project was that I went in with thinking about the biomedical model and how it functions and those kinds of issues. But then the other side was that needing to understand people working in that environment and the difficulties and pressure that they were placed under, that there's critiques that we have that they hold concerns about too, but they're working within a particular structure. So then how as sociologists can we actually give them some informational tools that might actually help them in that context rather than just constantly, you know, always being, I guess, ultra critical of things. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I've got to say, when I was more junior in my career, I always thought, where are the sociological voices? Where are the sociological voices? They're actually all there when you start looking and you start, um, I guess, engaging more. And also remembering that not everyone calls themselves a sociologist. And Catherine, you mentioned the importance of the audience. I think that's also a really critical point, whether or not we're talking about external audiences or, like Ben, the kind of audiences of our students. Um, you know, I've... I've taught pure sociology students, but at the moment I'm teaching people that come from all kinds of different backgrounds. They come into a degree where there's basically no entry requirements. Um, they're people that are caring for people with dementia. They're people working in the aged care sector. Um, so they're really, really diverse cohorts. So what tools can I give them from sociology that helps them in their practice? And some of the things that are really basic that was actually at the very start of this conversation, we're talking about things like agency and structure, you know, talking about things like, you know, and then, you know, translating what that means to them. For them, just learning about language and language use is actually really, really important because that's about relationships. Um, so I think there's so many powerful things that we've mentioned here. And, and I think I mean, for me, the basics of sociology is often what I go back to when I'm doing what I do. And also when I'm teaching students, regardless of their background, or if my PhD students are struggling, it's like, let's go back to the basics and think about and think through this to try and figure out where do we get to the end point? Where do we get to proposing things or talking about things? So that's my end bit. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. I really appreciate it. I personally strongly resonate with your point about relationships as well, keeping our um, contacts in the, for the people who are actually going to use their ideas is really important as a way to connect with them and with their needs, but also as to give you access, I think. I'm um, sorry, I saw in the chat uh, feed that Sophie, you'd like to really do a quick plug for the Applied Sociology Group as a space to continue. Uh, I think that's now's the time to do that. Okay, shameless. Um, thank you. No, but uh, I think these are the types of discussions that we have in our monthly um, meeting in the Applied Sociology Group. Um, so I think some of you or all of you, you're welcome to come and join us um, over there because, you know, a lot of it is what we're talking about. How do we get this stuff to, you know, do stuff in action and there's all sorts of different um just like uh fields of education health um so many things child safety community services um and uh there's a newsletter once a month that has all the things going on in this sort of thing um so and i saw your comment about applied sociology um so come on over to the Applied Sociology group. We can... Um, I'm yeah. already part of your thematic group. Yeah, okay. I do awesome. get all your newsletters and updates. And it just, 
it's, I mean, I'm still very green at this and I'm still an undergraduate. And actually, Ben, we are being taught at university all about the stepping backwards and it's a and also um so it was Catherine who said about stepping backwards we're we're fully because I'm a sociology major we are all being taught about stepping back from the knee-jerk reaction and look at the courses so anyway just to let you know that that's the sociologists that are coming through are all looking that, you know doing that um so it just makes sense to me that because I'm coming out into early career professional world and I just think well, there is such a place for us um, sociologists in society because we all agree that you know we have some of the answers um, and if not we have the tools so why and Peter you said that there are so many sociologists out there but they don't call themselves sociologists so I'm thinking why that's the language that needs to be changed it's like okay, so you, oh, I'm a doctor, I'm a this, I'm a that, I'm a sociologist. And so I think it, that's what needs to be plugged for us to get that value. Then we can translate that. I'm just, that's the way I'm seeing it. So when I come out of my degree and I'm doing my postgrads from next year on, I'm labelling myself a sociologist. And that's how I'm going to go out through my professional career I'm going, and I'm still teetering with the whole applied sociologist or sociologist, because I think that's what people need to know. That's what you do. And this is our value. That sounds yeah, and I, would, I would say that, um, Join so, us I in say, my group. Uh, so I was just going to say with that, um, I always call myself a sociologist always. Um, but there are times, um, where I will say I'm a social scientist and I'm a sociologist. And the reason why is really because, you know, a lot of people don't understand what sociology is. But if I say social scientist, it gives them a pathway into really understanding where I might be coming from. And I also like to remind people that we are a science. Mm. Can I just say, so has come as a media from convener, I just want to push for the fact that we are sociologists is a wonderful profession. And that's something I will be doing in the next couple of months with interviewing people and putting it out there. But one of the things I want to push for more, and I'm trying to do it through LinkedIn, is to get people in the media who, who on a panel to be sociologists and be proud and say, like, wouldn't it be great if we had on a 630 a regular sociologist come on? and talk about society and ideas as opposed to, you know, a psychologist, love them, they have their place, but it's time that we have a space in the media where we can vocalise so that students coming up or we get the question, oh, what is a sociologist? So that we get that conversation going. So sorry I bumped in, but this is how we have to do it. We have to be forcefully out there and get through the spaces like, the, like those ABC, and those sorts of ch media channels to have a sociologist come in and commentize what's happening. Sorry. Thanks, Rick. Um, Catherine, I think you have a, a, a comment to make, and I'll throw to you as a finalizing thing, I think, just a sec, because we're almost out of time. But oh. I've noticed Sally has rejoined and unmiked, un muted herself, so which means she probably has something to say as well. So I'll throw to Sally first, and then Catherine, perhaps you can give us a summary. No, no, sorry. Yeah. I, I was typing away there, and I didn't realise I'd unmuted. Go, Catherine. Right. Oh, look, I was just going uh, to say, yeah, Rick, I couldn't agree more. Um, and I think that there's two things in this that, that need kind of continued work. One is uh, the kind of long history of sociology as a kind of service discipline. Because sociological knowledge is so foundational, uh, it, it tends to attract a lot of students from a lot of different disciplines who kind of, you know, take that knowledge back to business studies or what it, psychology or uh, whatever it is. Um, so I, I think there's kind of work within institutions to do around kind of resisting this idea of sociology as a, a service discipline. Um, but then there's a, a bigger cultural issue in Australia about the role of social critique, uh, which I don't think has traditionally applied, uh, you know, the role of uh, critical theory in America, the role of sociology in um, France. Um, you know, other nations have, have had a, a much stronger engagement with social and cultural critique uh, than Australia has. Uh, so again, there's, there's, there's work to be done. 
That's fantastic. I think that's a really great note for us to finish on as well. So thank you all so much for coming and being part of this conversation. I've really enjoyed it. I hope you have as well. It's been excellent. We didn't even get to our third question, which was just about impact and engagement anyway. But I think that's what we were talking about. So that's fine. Thank you all again. Uh, please enjoy the rest of Social Sciences Week. Thanks, Thanks a lot, everyone. Lovely to meet you all. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks all.